for former First Lady Lady Bird Johnson, the wife of President Lyndon Johnson. It was held at the River Bend Center in Austin, Texas. The former First Lady died Wednesday at her home in Austin at the age of 94. This is about an hour 50 minutes. Welcome. Following the service, we ask that all guests remain in their seats until the family and first families have departed. Also, please make sure that you have cell phones turned off. We are deeply appreciative to the talents of the musicians listed in your program, and we thank Drs. Gloria Quinlan, Director of the Combined Choirs, and Dr. Stephen Burnaman, Pianist. We thank Bob Cannon and our Brass Ensemble whose participants are associated with the Austin Symphony and with the music school at the University of Texas at Austin. We thank Riverbend Center and its staff for being magnificent hosts. Following the service, members of Lady Bird Johnson's family will greet guests in the Fellowship Hall, which is across the plaza through which you entered the building.
Please stand. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be.
grace and glory. We remember before you this day our sister Claudia. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn, give us faith to see in death, the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the books of Wisdom and Daniel. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster. And they're going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watches over his elect. The word of the Lord. The 46th Psalm. God is our hope and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the hills be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the water thereof rage and swell, and though the mountains shake at the tempest of the same, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most Highest. God is in the midst of her, therefore shall she not be removed. God shall help her, and that right early. Be still then, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. A reading from the book of Romans. Who will separate us from love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. sentimental ballad from days long gone plays in my mind. I'll be seeing you. 
The lyrics of that song of half a century ago tell of carousels and wishing wells and sidewalk cafes. The images of Lady Bird that it conjures up are of a different order. They're of color and achievement and fulfillment. That song, if it had been written with her in mind, I think would go more this way. I'll be seeing you in every burst of roadside bloom in every Head Start schoolhouse room. I know that now I'll be seeing her, so many of us will, whenever we chance upon a coffee can geranium sitting on a windowsill. When we watch the strollers on the trail around Town Lake and in small, mysterious, but undeniable ways indeed, whenever we experience the return of spring. She created and left so many memories, all kinds, because she was so much to so many. Some people, John Gardner said of her, make the world a better place just by being the kind of people they are. That's Lady Bird. And beyond those well-known qualities that make the world a better place were others that could not have been counted in that calculus but contributed immeasurably nonetheless to the enjoyment of many of us. A quality that I would like to celebrate today before she is left to history will not be found in her official biography but is an essential part of the memory I carry. She was fun, just a whale of a lot of fun to be with. She had a delicious sense of humor, sometimes slightly mischievous, laced with surprises not always in keeping with her image. It was my good fortune to spend part of every summer with her in Martha's Vineyard. Our first trip there was some 30 years ago. It was only for a week, but a very tiring week, entirely packed with activities. Each night was the occasion for at least two and sometimes three festive events. One evening halfway through the week, as we sped from a cocktail party to a dinner, she said, I don't know why I'm doing this. Then, remember this was 30 years ago, and the, the uh, slogans of the 1960s were still part of our ongoing experience, she said, well, I do know. It's because I didn't say, hell no, I won't go. <laughs> and then there was the time we were in New York, having a breakfast meeting in the dining room of the Plaza Hotel. The members of a rock singing group, calling themselves the Village People, were seated there too. <laughs> All in full costume. One as an Indian, the other as a construction worker, another as a policeman. Recognizing Mrs. Johnson, the leader came over, introduced his group, proclaimed his admiration, and asked if she would have her picture taken with him. <laughs> Ever gracious, she of course agreed. Afterwards, she asked and was told who they were. <laughs> well, she said, I wonder if we just made the cover of their next album. <laughs> it was all a part of her many splendored personality, as was her civility, and her keen intelligence, and her sustaining faith, and the indomitable spirit of her final days. In all her varieties, she brought a special charm into our world, a special mix of grace and steel of wit and wisdom, a spectacular blend of so many causes, so many contributions, so many things to value. Thank you for showing us the beauty around us, a woman wrote her recently, on the, and on the anniversary of Head Start, the program to give educational opportunities to poor children, which she launched as national chairman, many wrote to tell her how that program had changed their lives. They wrote her on a myriad of issues over the years. She lit a fire in this country that has never gone out, a colleague of her White House days said of her. It has never gone out, and it won't. It glows in places and hearts without number. 
it glows in mine, and it beats with the rhythm of many memories. I will remember and forever be grateful for her vision and wisdom and the strength of, of, of her support to me in the great adventure we shared of, of, of fashioning an institution, historical institution, to preserve a noble legacy. I'll be seeing her in all the places of beauty she created and touched, and I'll think of her and hear her voice again in all the echoes of joy and laughter she brought to my life. I tried for a long time to persuade her to become a Baptist. I thought if I couldn't do it, President Carter could. And when he couldn't, I thought President Clinton could. But she once said to me, listen, if you Baptists have any rain left over, any water left over, put it on the flowers. They need it more than I do. It is unthinkable to me that she's gone. She was so much a part of our landscape, so much a part of our lives and our times, so much a part of our country for so long that I began to imagine her with us always. And now, although the fields of purple, orange, and blue will long evoke her gifts to us, her vibrant presence has departed, and we are left to mourn our loss of her, even as we celebrate her life. Some people arriving earlier this morning were asked, are you sitting with the family? I looked around and thought, everyone is sitting with the family. That's how she thought of us. Bring another chair. Bring another dozen chairs. He'd call home and say, Bird, I'm bringing the Senate to dinner tonight. <laughs> it was the first infinitely expanding table I'd ever seen in my life. When I arrived in Washington in 1954 to work in LBJ's mailroom between my sophomore and junior years, I didn't know a single person in town, not even the Johnsons, whom I only met that first week. She soon recognized that the weekends were especially lonesome for me, and she called me one day to ask me over for Sunday brunch. I had never even heard of Sunday brunch in Marshall, Texas, <laughs> much less been to one. For all I knew, it was an Episcopalian sacrament. <laughs> when I arrived at 30th place, the family was there, the little girls, Lady Bird and himself, but so were Richard Russell, Sam Rayburn, and J. Edgar Hoover, not one of whom looked like my image of an Episcopalian priest. They were all sitting around the room in that very smallish dining room, reading the newspaper, except for LBJ, who was on the phone. If this is their idea of a sacrament, I thought, I'll just stay a Baptist. <laughs> but Mrs. Johnson knew something about the bachelors she had invited there, including the kid fresh out from her native East Texas. On a Sunday morning, they needed family, and she had offered us communion at her table. It was, in a way, a sacrament. It was also very good politics. She told me something that summer that would make a difference in my life. She was shy. And in the presence of powerful men, she usually held her counsel. Sensing that I was shy, too, and aware I had no experience to enforce my opinions, she said, don't worry. If you're unsure of what to say, just ask questions. And I promise you that when they leave, they will think you were the smartest one in the room just for listening to them. <laughs> Word will get around, she said. She knew the ways of the world and how they could be made to work for you even when you didn't fully understand what was really going on. She told me once years later that she didn't even understand everything about the man she married. Nor did she want to, she said, as long as he needed her. <laughs> he needed her. You know the famous incident 
Once trying to locate her in a crowded room, he growled aloud, where's Lady Bird? And she replied, right behind you, darling, where I've always been. <laughs> Whosoever loves believes the impossible, Elizabeth Browning wrote. Lady Bird truly loved the man she often found impossible. I'm no more bewildered by Lyndon than he is bewildered by himself, she once told me. But then she added, that makes two of us in the family. Like everyone he loved, she often found herself in the path of his Vesuvius eruptions. During the campaign of 1960, I slept in the bed in their basement when we returned from the road for sessions of the Senate. She knew I was lonesome for Judith and our six-month-old son who were back in Texas, and she would often come down two flights of stairs to ask if I was doing all right. One night, the senator and I got home even later, and he brought with him some unresolved dispute from the Senate cloakroom. At midnight, I could still hear him upstairs carrying on as if he was about to purge the Democratic caucus. Pretty soon, I heard her footsteps on the stair, and I called out, Mrs. Johnson, you don't need to come down here. I'm, I'm all right. And she called back, well, I was just coming down to tell you I'm all right, too. <laughs> she seemed to grow calmer as the world around her became more furious. Thunderbolts struck so often in her life that I had to wonder why the gods on Olympus kept testing her. She lost her mother in an accident when she was five. She was two cars behind JFK in Dallas. She was in the White House when Martin Luther King was shot and Washington burned. She grieved for the family of Robert Kennedy and for the lives lost in Vietnam. Early in the White House, a well-meaning editor came up from Texas and said, you poor thing having to follow Jackie Kennedy. Mrs. Johnson's mouth dropped open. And she said, oh no, don't, don't pity me. Grieve for Mrs. Kennedy, she lost her husband. I still have my Lyndon. She aimed for the consolation and comfort of others. It was not only her talent at negotiating the Civil War that waged in his nature. It was not just the way she remained unconscripted by the factions into which family, friends, and advisors inevitably divide around a powerful figure. She kept open all the roads to reconciliation. Like her beloved flowers in the field, she was a woman of many hues. A strong manager, a canny investor, a shrewd judge of people, friend and foe, and she never confused the two. Deliberate in coming to judgment, she was sure in conclusion. But let me speak especially and exclusively and briefly of the one quality that most captured my admiration and affection, her courage. It is the fall of 1960. We're in Dallas, where neither Kennedy nor Johnson are local heroes. We start across the street from the Adolphus to the Baker Hotel. The reactionary congressman from Dallas has organized a demonstration of women, pretty women, in costumes of red, white, and blue, waving little American flags above their cowboy hats. At first, I take them to be cheerleaders, having a good time. But suddenly, they're a snarling, angry mob, salivating, spitting. And a roar, a primal, terrifying roar, swells around us. My first experience with collective hate roused to a fever pitch. I'm right behind the Johnsons. She's taken his arm, and as she turns left and right, nodding to the mob, I can see that she is smiling. And I see in the eyes of some of those women a confusion. What I take to be the realization among them that this is them at their most uncivil, confronting a woman who is the triumph of civility. So help me, her very demeanor creates a small zone of grace in the midst of that tumultuous throng. And they move back a little, and then a little, Mrs. Johnson continuing to nod and smile until we're inside the baker and upstairs in the suite. Now, 
LBJ is smiling. He knows that Texas was up for grabs until this moment, and the backlash will decide it for us, as it did. But Mrs. Johnson has pulled back the curtains and is looking down that street as the mob disperses, and she's seen something dark and disturbing. Still holding the curtain back as if she were peering into the future, she says almost to herself, things will never be the same again. Now it is 1964. The disinherited descendants of slavery still denied their rights as citizens after a century of segregation have resolved to claim for themselves the American promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. President Johnson has thrown the full power of his presidency to their side, and he has just signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the greatest single sword of justice raised for equality since the Emancipation Proclamation. A few weeks later, both Lyndon and Lady Blurd plunge into the campaign for election in his own right. He's more or less given up on the South, but she will not. These were her people. They were her roots and she's not ready to sever them. So she sets out on a whistle-stop journey of nearly 1,700 miles through the heart of her past. She's on her own, campaigning independently, across the Mason-Dixon line, down the buckle of the Bible Belt, all the way to the port of New Orleans. I cannot, all these years later, do justice to what she faced. The boos, the jeers, the hecklers, the crude signs and cruder gestures, the insults and the threats. This was the land still ruled by John Birch and Jim Crow, who used the cross and the club to enforce it. 1964, and bathroom signs still read, white ladies and colored women. In Richmond, she was greeted with signs that read, fly away, Lady Bird. In Charleston, Blackbird, go home. <coughs> Children planted in front rows as near as I am to you while she spoke held up signs, Johnson is a nigger lover. In Savannah, her teenage daughter is cursed. The air has become so menacing that we run a separate engine 15 minutes ahead of her in case of a bomb. She later said people were concerned for me, but I was more concerned about the engineer out there in front. Rumors spread of snipers, and in Florida, the threats are so ominous, the FBI orders a yard-by-yard -yard sweep of a seven-mile bridge that her train would cross. She never flinches. Up to 40 times a day from the platform of that caboose, she will speak, sometimes raising a single white-gloved hand to punctuate her words, the lady always. When the insults in South Carolina grew so raucous, she quieted the ugly words by saying, they're coming not from the good people of South Carolina, but from the state of confusion. Time and again, she announced, you might not like what I'm saying, but at least you understand the way I'm saying it. <laughs> and in Columbia, she answered hecklers with what one writer called a maternal bark. And she said, this is a country of many viewpoints. I respect your right to express your own. Now express, let me express mine. Thank you. An advanced man called me back at the White House from a payphone at the local train depot. He was choking back the tears. As long as I live, he said in a voice breaking with emotion, I will thank God I was here today so that I can tell my children that courage makes a difference. Yes, she planted flowers and wanted and worked for highways and parks and vistas that opened us to the technicolor splendors of our world. Walk this weekend among the paths and trails and flowers and see the beauty she loved. But as you do remember, she also loved democracy and saw a beauty in it, rough though the ground may be, hard and stony and as tangled and as threatened with blight as nature itself. 
and remember that this shy little girl from Karnak, Texas, with eyes as wistful as the cypress and manners as soft as the whispering pine, grew up to show us how to cultivate the beauty in democracy, the voice raised against the mob, the courage to overcome fear, the convictions as true as steel. Claudia Alta Taylor, Lady Bird Johnson, served the beauty in democracy as she did the beauty in nature and the beauty in us. And right to the end of her long and bountiful life, she inspired us to serve them too. My name is Nicole Nugent Covert, and I'm the third grandchild of Claudia Alta Taylor Johnson, AKA Lady Bird Johnson, First Lady, Wildflower Lady, but known to her family as just Nene. My role here today is to share with you a little insight on one of the many titles that my grandmother had. Yes, it is true that she served our country so lovingly and dutifully as First Lady. It is also true that she was so devoted to her precious daughters, Linda and Lucy. The dedication and loyalty that ran and will continue to run amongst the three of them are such strong ones that I too can only hope that I share that same experience with my mother, siblings, and children. I would like to think 
that her favorite role was that of grandmother. There will never be another Nini. In my youth, there were times that we were to be seen and not heard. In my childhood, there was a children's table. I might also add that it was in the kitchen at the ranch, far enough away from the dining room so that the grown-ups wouldn't be disturbed. In my youth, Christmas at the ranch was the biggest deal, still is, even to the grown-ups. In my youth, there were trips to exotic countries and discoveries of a whole new world. Fast forward 20 years. The day was October 24, 1995. Nene's first great-grandchild, Tatum Rebecca Nugent, discovered America. November 14, 1996, Johnson Saunders Covert became her first great-grandson, only to be followed by Taylor Baines Nugent, Claudia Robinson Covert, Eloise Patrick Turpin McIntosh, Tucker William Thomas McIntosh, Lucy Bella McIntosh, Sophia Baines Broad, Isabella Taylor Broad, and finally Madeline Taylor Florio. This is when I think that Nene found that her most favorite role was that of great-grandmother. There was no longer a children's table. They sat at the table, usually right next to Nene, so that she could see them. The banging of pots and pans for a marching band parade were encouraged by Nene. Christmas time at the ranch was just like it was when the president was alive. Presents everywhere and great-grandchildren putting on a Christmas pageant. The trips and discoveries now took place at the LBJ Ranch are looking at wildflowers. Nene loved swimming with the children. Nene loved showing them every square inch of the ranch. Nene loved just watching them, all with their beguiling smiles. She exposed all of us to a better world filled with the most amazing people. As many of you know, Nene was the best letter writer, not only in her abundance of letters, but also in her words. So today I'll read to you a letter that I have written to Nene, telling her about all of the wonderful things her great-grandchildren remember about her. Dearest Nene, oh, how I wish you were still here to see your most precious great-grandchildren. I know that all of them loved you the mostest. When I asked the great-grands what they loved most about you or their favorite memory of you, this is what I got. Tatum, who's 11, I loved going to the ranch on Sundays so I could help Poppy and spend time with Nene. I know how much Nene loved being at the ranch, and I loved being there with her. I will never forget when she came to read to my kindergarten class. Johnson, who's 10, I'll never forget the dinner I shared with Nene and Coach Royal after you two won the national championship. <laughs> I will miss lying on my Nene's bed as she stroked her fingers through my hair. She loved my hair. I loved how Nene would come to my games. She even got to come to my championship baseball game. I love baseball, but not as much as I love my Nene. Taylor, nine. I loved how Nene would come to all of our camp closings at Camp Mystic. I loved how Nene would always treasure anything that I gave to her. She even liked my scribbles when I was little. Claudia, almost nine. My favorite memory of Nene is when I dressed up as her at school to do my biography, and she came to watch. <laughs> Everyone thought it was so neat that the person that I did my report on actually showed up. <laughs> I also loved having sleepovers with my Nene. Eloise, who's seven, I loved being able to read Little House on the Prairie to Nene while she lay in bed. I also loved telling the story of that when Nene could no longer speak, my little brother Tucker declared that he was going to find her lost voice. Tucker, who's six, I loved playing the guitar for Nene and watching her clap and smile the best that she could. Her favorite song of mine was, and this is a quote, he's got the whole world in his hands. Lucy Bella, who's three, I loved it most when Nene would give me hugs and kisses. Sophia Baines, who's three, she told Nene that it was okay that she was old, just like my doggy Bruno. <laughs> On the Wednesday night that Nene passed, I had Sophia, and Sophia asked me where Nene was, and I told her she was in heaven. And she looked at me and said, you mean like the Bahamas?
Isabella Taylor and Madeline Taylor's parents have helped in their favorite memory with Nene. Isabella's took place last Monday night when she leaned over Nene to kiss her goodnight and she told Nene, night night Nene, and blew her a kiss. Madeline's parents will be forever grateful that at Madeline's baptism at the LBJ Ranch, Nene was able to sign the cross on Madeline's forehead. Nene, these children were so lucky to have had the opportunity to share in your life. No one could have asked for a better role model. You have led by example, and I know that these 10, soon to be 11, great-grandchildren will follow in your footsteps. Nene, I could never put into words or pick one special memory. I will miss seeing your smile and big bright eyes. I will miss the drive-bys that I would do with the kids in our pajamas. I will miss seeing the look on your face when John would read to you about baseball and basketball. I will miss spending weekends and birthdays at the ranch. I will miss my brother Lyndon trying once more to convince you to take a helicopter ride with him. <laughs> I will miss the ear that you would lend and the guidance that you would give, especially reminding Brent and me to take care of each other. I will miss the confusion that everyone else had when we would talk about the three Claudias and the two Nicoles. I will miss seeing the excitement in your eyes whenever a grandchild or a great-grandchild would call you. But most of all, I will just miss you. Nene, I feel so blessed to have been a part of your life. You have enriched me, encouraged me, believed in me, been there for me, but most of all, you have loved me. Nine night, Nene, sleep tight, I love you. My grandmother was pragmatic, she was honest, and she was very funny. She once told my mother that if she'd known how her life was going to turn out, there are only two things that she would have done differently. First of all, she would have gotten a nose job. <laughs> and then she would have insisted that people call her by her real name. <laughs> now, I can't really speak to the first, because I always thought she was beautiful. I love the way she looked, I love the way she smelled, I love the way it felt when you hugged her. But I think the name Ladybird stuck because it was so appropriate. It really captured what was so true and ideal about her, the essence of a lady. There was, I admit, some initial, apparently, confusion in the Washington diplomatic community early on as a young congressional wife when some of them wanted to know about the existence of a possible Lord Bird. <laughs> but she was always gracious. I don't think I've ever read an article about my grandmother that didn't actually mention her being gracious. And that's just not one of those words that's thrown around a lot outside of Southern Living Magazine. <laughs> I have two very small examples out of a lifetime of thousands and thousands of incidences. The first, I, have, I had two grandmothers, and only one of them was famous. And many times, you will find that in celebrating the milestones of grandchildren, they are thrown together at occasions, particularly at college graduations and things like that. And my grandmother Johnson, without ever being obvious about it, without saying anything, without doing anything you could point your finger at, always made sure that any honor, any courtesy extended, any sign of respect that went to her also went to my grandmother, Rob. That was the kind of lady she was. The other thing that stuck in my mind was I remember being told that Barry Goldwater was going to come and speak to the LBJ Library. And I was younger then, and I knew less, and I thought, well, she's not going to want to go hear him speak. He might say something not nice. And I was correct that she wasn't going to attend, but I was wrong. Why? And she told me, oh, no, no, darling. I'm so glad that he's coming to speak. I appreciate him coming. But I don't want to be there because I don't want to make him feel uncomfortable. 
I want him to be able to say exactly what he thought and to be critical and to say what was on his mind. And I feel that he was too much of a gentleman if he saw me sitting there in the front row. He might not be able to say that. So instead, she let him know that she wasn't going to be able to attend the speech, but she was going to host a special dinner for him with him as the guest of honor afterwards, the 10th row at the library. And those were wonderful dinners, I can tell you. My grandmother was the most quietly confident, least needy person I have ever known. She never made demands on anyone. Most people, even in a good way, we need other people to do things for us to make us happy. We need them to give us a job. We need them to admit us into the school of our choice or into a select group. We need their approval. We need their love. Sometimes we need them to do their God-given duty and hurry up and give us grandchildren. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> but my grandmother, she loved and rejoiced in your accomplishments and in your happiness, but she didn't need you to do anything for her. She was wonderfully grounded, and she drew strength from the nature around her. And in fact, I think sometimes the only thing she ever really needed was either a little more rain or a little less rain in the Texas Hill Country. <laughs> this year, my Texas relatives tell me we had a little too much rain. <laughs> because she didn't need anything, paradoxically, you wanted to do more for her. My grandfather was very famous for his persuasiveness. And you may have heard about the Johnson treatment but I've always suspected that Nini was equally effective, although we'll never know because she had such a light touch. So it's impossible to gauge the full extent. She succeeded by believing and encouraging people to do their best, and she really did think the best about you. And she let you take all the applause, so whether it was a grandchild actually eating all of their vegetables in that particular meal, or whether it was a city council that had voted to fund a new river walk. She always let other people take the credit. She was entirely uninterested in credit. And growing up in Washington, a political world, that is so hard for me to believe. They had to work really hard to get her to change the name of the National Wildflower Research Center. And finally, they only succeeded by appealing to her pragmatism. They said, look, will raise more money if we change the name to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So finally, she was willing to do that. She never cared about the recognition. Last night, my sisters and I, late at night, went to go see the tower lit up. And we got in the car, and the first place that we went to, we didn't have a very good view. So my sister said, let's go over and see it from the library. And I have to be completely honest with you, I was pretty crabby at that point. And I said, it's hot, and it's late, and I'm tired, you want, and I'm pregnant. You want me to get out of the car and walk? But fortunately, my sisters inherited more of my grandmother's gentle good temper, and they managed to coax me with laughter and a little teasing to get out of the car. And we walked over to the plaza of the library. And I'm so glad that we did. Because while the tower was lit up in a glorious orange, the thing that was far more beautiful to me was to see all the people, this was after midnight, streaming towards the library in groups of ones or twos, and in some cases families bringing children who really probably should have been in bed by that time of night. And they were coming to see Lady Bird Johnson one last time. It was the people of Texas coming to say goodbye to a lady. Nini would tell us all to take a deep breath. My grandmother, my Nini, our Nini, was a beautiful person who spread that beauty to everything and everyone around her. I know that you all are familiar with her beautification efforts to preserve the natural beauty of this wonderful world and to plant wildflowers on everything that wasn't moving fast enough to get away. 
Like many of you, I see the fruits of her efforts and dreams every day when I run along the town lake hike and bike trail, when I bike in the hill country, or just when I drive down the road. In fact, I frequently find myself whispering, "Thank you, Nini," when I'm running or biking or driving. But just as often, I think of her other beautification effort, and that was the beautification of the human spirit, of humanity. Just as she was planting wildflowers and trees and cleaning up the highways, she was planting and nurturing kindness and generosity and grace. To me, her other beautification effort was in planting the fruits of the spirit: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fidelity, gentleness, and self-control. So often, when I brought friends to the ranch or just had visitors in her presence, I heard from them again and again how very gracious and welcoming and warm she was. And we've all heard that today. She made every person she encountered feel as if they were so very, very special and so very wanted at that exact moment. It was as if there was nothing that could make her happier than seeing you right then. And not only did she make you feel special, but she made you want to make other people feel special. It was as if her grace and kindness just washed off onto you. When you came near, she made you want to be more kind and generous and gracious. This same kind of sharing of her spirit, of grace and love and joy and kindness, was evident in those close to her. We saw it in the faces, in the words, and the actions of friends and family, of those with whom she worked, of the ranch and her office staff. Her agents, and more recently, her caregivers, all of whom were there, loving and supporting not only her but all of us and each other in Nini's final tender moments on this earth. These fruits of the spirit that she nurtured have been planted in all of us. As many of you know, my Nini and I had a standing Tuesday night dinner date for the past eight years. Although in more recent years we spent many of our Tuesdays at home talking or reading, for many years we went out to restaurants on Tuesday nights. Often people would come over for a quick second to say hello and express their appreciation for something our Nini had done, or just for being the kind of person she was. And she would thank them for their kindness. Quite often, though, as we were leaving the restaurant. We would pass by tables, and we would hear voices call out, "Thank you, Lady Bird," or "We love you, Lady Bird." That was her spirit. She caused people to break out into spontaneous thank yous and "I love yous." What a wonderful, wonderful thing! So, Nini, I will miss you every Tuesday and more, and I thank you. For all of your beautification efforts of every kind, and I hope that all who love her will work to beautify the land, and beautify the spirit, and make both wildflowers and I love you flourish all over this world and the people she so loved. Nanny, I knew we shouldn't have asked these people to speak. <laughs> This is the worst 
group that I've had to follow since the time I had to, to follow uh, uh, Jack Valenny and, and uh, Bill Moyers in the toast to Tom Johnson. I said all we needed was Billy Graham. <laughs> Very hard act. Only thing I can say is, Lucy, it's going to be tougher. That makes you feel better. <laughs> we talked about sharing, everybody sharing our speeches so we all wouldn't get up and say the same thing. The truth is, nobody wanted to share their speech because they didn't want anybody preceding them to steal from it. <laughs> so I would like to thank Bill Moyers for stealing all my best lines. <laughs> and I should just sit down because, you know, uh, as Billy Sunday said, I never heard a bad short speech. <laughs> and you don't win any souls after the first 15 minutes. Well, Mother, this weather is just like you. Driving over here, the rain was falling on us as we walked, and we got out of the car uh, as we walked, and the sun was shining. That's Nene. She's want to make sure that she balances everything. Everybody gets something. And I just thought, Nene, this is a great day for it. But remember, not tomorrow. <laughs> well, they, so many times when we talked to Mother, and Mother, you know, didn't fear death at all. And she wanted to talk all about what she wanted at her service. It's very pragmatic. This I like, that I don't, you know, and so forth. And um, so every time she'd say, I want you to really celebrate. Well, that's a tough, tough, tough assignment, Mother. And yet, as we gather to send you off on what you always called your final great adventure, I think that at 94, you put it off as long as you could. We had time to relish those sweet days, to welcome my first grandbaby, and to make oh so many memories. But we knew that day would come. And I always told you that so many would want to be there to celebrate with you that we would have to do it in springtime. And she said, no. She said, no, I can't die in springtime because I don't want to miss one wildflower spring. And Nene, this was the most beautiful spring for wildflowers. Of course, I would claim to everybody that mother planted every one of them. It was just one of those ways she thought about everything. I told everyone that would listen that I just couldn't speak at her, her funeral because I was just going to be too emotional. Because not only would your death devastate me, mother, but you were my best friend. You were the person that I could, could tell my secrets to. You were the person that, that I could express my, my fears, my concerns. You were also the one I could tell about my boyfriends. And um, I would say, now, Mother, I'm telling you this as my best friend, not as my mother. <laughs> and she would, she would understand that when and not say things like, well, don't you remember last week you said how much you were in love with this other guy? <laughs> it was wonderful. We had this very, very, very special relationship. And it'll never, it'll never happen again. Mother always thought of everything. You always thought of everything as a great adventure, a mantra that you instilled in us. It was very good advice when we had to do something that we didn't want to do at all. Just think of it as a great adventure. <laughs> Along with your love of adventure was your Puritan work ethic. Something you tried to give all of us. I'm not so sure that you ever learned just to play, just to have fun. And so I would tell you that, that uh, you had to go off with me. We had to escape from the White House particularly and go off and just have a fun lunch. No, you know, not for the National Heart Society or to raise money for some other good group, but no, just a fun lunch out at a public place. Or go to the National Gallery, and I'd drag you away from your desk, and I knew that you would do it 
for me. You would do it as a favor for me. I want to learn how to play Mimi. But for you, everything needed a purpose. And in the White House days, everything you did had a great purpose. And the Great Depression, I think, left a deep impact on you, resulting in another one of your legendary qualities, your frugality. And we teased you about it unmercifully. Daddy used to say that he couldn't reach you because you were always out trying to save 10 cents on a can of beans. You wanted to get three bids on everything, and you wanted to hold on till 2010 so you, we wouldn't have to pay any estate taxes. <laughs> Oh, darn. <laughs> well, Mother didn't let us down very often. Later in life, she thought it was really frivolous to spend money. She wasn't interested in, in, in things for her personally. Uh, things didn't matter to her. But she knew that the greatest thing she could give you were memories. And so she would take us on wonderful trips to places that we wouldn't afford to go. And I know one time we were going through London and my children were traveling with us and they leaned over and they said, oh, the Savoy, that's where we stayed with Nene. <laughs> she, uh, she gave them lots of memories. And uh, I'm sorry raised their expectations in many ways. <laughs> but what you would also do, Nene, is you would invite your friends to come and stay in some wonderful, glorious place. You'd rent a... a a wonderful house, particularly overseas, and we would go and have a wonderful time. One of the ones that I, re I remember the most, though, was one time when she invited us, remember this, Nene? You invited us to uh, come to see you in France, in this wonderful French chateau, very old, very historic, and all 15 of us had only one bathroom to share. <laughs> well, of course, one of your biggest adventures started when you married Daddy, and he got enrolled you in politics. It was an unglamorous role for you. I know you, you told me what you did mostly were things like make sure he had a clean white shirt to wear, and, and getting on the phone and calling everybody in the telephone book from A to Z and ask them to vote for him. Uh, he had lots of little projects for all of us. When Chuck became a candidate for office, I said, Mother, what advice can you give me how I could help Chuck? And what did you do for Daddy? And she said, well, I followed behind him everywhere and said thank you to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, in those early days, those early campaign days, you just sat reluctantly, shyly, behind Daddy. Uh, but soon, at Daddy's prodding, that shy campaigner went out on her own to campaign. Remember that, Nene? I don't think it was your favorite thing, but you always did it so well. And it ta didn't take very long for you to realize that politics was part of the poetry of democracy. And as your pl own platform changed, you were able to lobby for your causes. Your love of nature, born from a barefoot footsteps deep in that East Texas woods, and that found that voice in your tireless work for nationwide beautification. When your political courage, uh, as daddy's eyes and ears, you took us through the South on that railroad uh, Lady Bird special that Bill Moyers mentioned. And then later at 70, in what you called your self-described happy hour of your life. And that always makes me feel good because I'm approaching that direction. And that became the living tribute to your idea of paying rent for the space you took up on Earth. And you started that wonderful Wildflower Center. Your advocacy for clean roadside views and for the beauty of nature and the sweet wildflowers, or as you call them, weeds without press agents. <laughs> but the thing that was most important to you 
particularly, well, I should say most important after Daddy died, was how much you loved Lucy and you loved me. And you spoke of that summer of 1947 when Lucy was born. Not my favorite time to be pushed aside, but that was a particularly happy time, you said, because you sat on that screen porch at 30th Place, just all three of us looking out and at your victory garden and all your flowers. And it gave you that feeling that time was standing still and of being under the spell of idyllic contentment. And then following your stroke in 2002, it became our turn to care for you, as you had for us. Your family in Texas showered you with love and attention, and I envied my daughter Catherine for those Tuesday night dates for eight years. And our daughter Lucinda planned her wedding to be in in Austin at the Wildflower Center so she could make sure that you got to come. And our dear sweet Jennifer, our, our teacher in, our math teacher in Washington, well in Virginia really, took off, took off a year from school just so she could come down here to be with her, her Nini. It brought all of my children so much closer to you, Nini. Thank you for giving them that gift of knowing you even better. Lucy's proximity to you was also to become one of my richest blessings. Your children and grandchildren, Lucy, surrounded Nini with that constant love. And Lucy's tender care of Mama when she could no longer care for herself was born of the purest essence of love. Lucy has earned her own place in heaven. As you moved through your 80s, mother, you portrayed your life as relishing every day, feeling like a jug of rich wine, poured it to its full, to the top and overflowing. One of your ministers described you as being a vessel of God's perfect love. Your love for him, like that jug of wine, was full to the top, and it spilled over to bless your family and friends and all of you across the country. Mother, the angels are here to receive you. And as you always told us, know that you are loved. Mother would want me to thank of each of you for coming today. And I want to let you in on a little secret. You were all her favorites. <laughs> but I especially want to acknowledge the travels of the First Lady, Mrs. Bush, former President and Senator Clinton, President and Mrs. Carter, Mrs. Reagan, Caroline and Edward Schlossberg, Mrs. Bush, Susan Bale Fords, Susan Ford Bales, Tricia Nixon Cox and her husband, and my good friend Maria Shriver, and the governor and the first lady of the great state of Texas and our own Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. Thank you so much for your presence. Mother would have been deeply honored, and Linda and I are deeply grateful. Once I asked my mother, how do you want to be remembered? She replied in her usual self-effacing way, well, I made a lot of little lists, and I scratched them off. Little lists were my mother's constant companion. Campaign schedules, thank you lists, and an ever-growing Christmas list. Her lists were for community causes, business, and family, but they were all lists 
to serve others. Sometimes I'd say, can't we take off time from duty for just a few days? She couldn't. Duty was her oxygen. But she didn't seem to feel the burden of duty, only the calling. In the final years, Mother let me cross her lists off. Often I would make a speech or host an event for her. While I could be her representative, I knew there was no substitute for Lady Bird Johnson. I will always be especially grateful to my husband, Ian, for quietly helping Mother with her lists in big ways and small, managing our business, serving her wildflower center, and reading to her on ranch weekends, and to his mother, Rita, for becoming another one of those best friends. We never succeeded entirely at weaning mother from the list, but aging became our ally. She finally gave herself permission to just spend time delighting in family. Mother always said life can be separated into two categories, the if-onlys and the aren't we grateful. One of the most profound if-onlys was the shortness of daddy's life. She was barely 60 when he died. Mother, for the greatest inheritance one can ever know, parents who adored each other until death, I'm forever grateful. When my precious Lyndon, Nicole, Rebecca, and Claudia were young, I asked mother if she would take them sometimes on an adventure without their siblings. She tailor-made an individual trip for each of them, from the beaches of Kitty Hawk, to the redwoods of California, to the museums and the theaters of New York City. These trips meant the world to my children, and therefore to me. But perhaps mother's greatest gift to all her grandchildren occurred when she inculcated them with the desire to be involved and caring citizens by giving them a Christmas check for the charity of their choice. <laughs> they returned her love by working for causes she held dear in the environment, education, health care, social justice, and with regular loving calls and visits. And I'm so very proud of each and every one of you. Mother, for widening our world through travel, for teaching us life's greatest joy is found in giving. Our family is forever grateful. The grandchildren say those who describe their grandmother in only gracious terms obviously never played cards with her. <laughs> Nini, for your merry and mischievous spirit, we are forever grateful. Until the day Mama went to heaven, her passion was the Wildflower Center. She loved the natural world feeling a keen responsibility to nurture it as it had nurtured her. Family always said, if you want Nina to carry your picture in her wallet, make sure you get it taken in the wildflowers. <laughs> Mother, for your commitment to what you believed in, our world is more beautiful, and we're all forever grateful. Mother maintained a close relationship with her employees. James Davis worked for her nearly 50 years. And Mama said, when James Davis goes, I'll go. <laughs> Staff was family for Mama. And she was family for them. My parents had no former staff, just former paid staff. Every foreign trip and Christmas, Mother gave her Secret Service a party. She respected them professionally and cared about them personally. For nearly half a century, they were with her, 
and they still stand steadfast by her side. Would Mother's staff and Secret Service past and present stand so I can thank them publicly as Mother always did? Lessons and loyalty, Mother, we're all forever grateful. The last years of Mama's life, Linda called daily, traveling halfway across the country monthly for long and loving visits. She was Mama's firstborn, her kindred spirit, her link to the Washington world that Mother loved. They just don't make more devoted daughters than Linda, for being there for mother and for me, Linda. I'm forever grateful. Tragically, strokes stilled Mama's eloquent voice. Failing sight kept this most literate of women from reading, and atrial fibrillation sapped her boundless energy. But we were fortunate to have the most able and faithful doctors, nurses, and caregivers to help ease these traumas. Would you all please stand so we can thank you from the bottom of our hearts. My last years with Mama were magical. We spent a part of nearly every day together. No longer on public stage, we made private times that we both had hungered for. I had so much re fun reading to her, retreating to the ranch, widening our worlds at the LBJ Library, wheeling her around Town Lake and the Wildflower Center, where countless members of her perpetual fan club stopped to thank her and simply giving her bedside nursing care. I teased her saying, Mother, 35 years later, you're finally getting a return on your investment in sending me to nursing school. <laughs> because of Mother, my reading list was more worthy. My conversations were more substantive. I exercised more often, and I was always always learning. A few weeks before Mother died, I was taking visiting relatives to the extraordinary Blanton Art Museum. I recommend it to anybody from out of town. Mother was on IV antibiotics, a feeding tube, and oxygen. But she wasn't going to let little things like that deter her from discovering another great art museum. What a picture we were literally rolling through the museum like a mobile hospital. <laughs> Every Sunday, Mother's faithful priest's visit began, would begin with communion and ended with Mother's applause. Mama had so much to be frustrated about, but she never lost her temper or her thoughtfulness for others. My church pre preaches the concept of grace. My mother exemplified it. One of my mother's favorite comforts was a five-year-old great-grandson's recording, singing and playing. He's got the whole world in his hands. Mother seemed to have the whole world in her hands, too, teaching me by example not only how to live, but how to die. For these lessons in faith, Mother, I will be forever grateful. Claudia Alta Taylor, Lady Bird Johnson, 
First Lady, Mother, Aunt Bird, Nini, or sometimes to children simply Mother Nature, a woman with many names and many roles. Mama, by any name, we all will be forever grateful for you. It seems right for Mother's eloquent words to be my last. The night we returned permanently to Texas from the White House, Mother wrote in her diary, and I quote, A little past nine, I went to bed with a line of poetry reeling through my mind. I think it's from India's love lyrics. I seek to celebrate my glad release, the tents of silence, and the camp of peace. And yet, it's not quite the right exit line for me, because I have loved almost every day of these five years. There is a hole in all of our hearts as we finally release you, Mother, for we have loved every moment with you. Would you please stand? <clears throat> and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Claudia. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of her lasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now may the blessings of the Lord rest and remain upon all his people, in every land, in every tongue. The Lord meet in mercy all that seek him. The Lord comfort all that suffer and mourn. The Lord hasten his kingdom and give you and all his people peace forevermore. Amen. Amen.
go in peace to love and serve the Lord.